CSS is a powerful presentation language, but there are many things it has historically been unable to do. Now a great many of those things will become possible or even easy to do, thanks to the new CSS has pseudoclass. Thanks to work by Agalia, has is already available behind a developer flag in Chromium browsers and will soon be publicly available without the flag. That work encouraged Apple to land their own implementation of has in WebKit, and it's already available in Safari for both desktop and mobile. But what does has do? It can be a parent selector, but it can also be so much more, and we'll explore just a few of the infinite possibilities in this short video. With has, authors can name an element and then check for whether that element has other elements in a declared relationship to it. In this relatively simple case, the selector matches whenever an A element has a B element inside it. But unlike the child selector, which operates on the last element given, has selects, in this case, the A element. Thus, in this particular case, the styles are applied to the A element instead of the B element. That's impressive enough, but let's consider more complex cases. Take this markup, for example, which describes two figure elements. One figure contains some sample code, and the other contains an SVG element. So let's say we want to float to the right any figures that contain SVG elements while leaving all other figures in the normal flow. Applying this rule in a has supporting browser is all that's needed. No other classes have to be applied to the figures or to other elements in the document. This is possible because the document structure is all that has needs to work its magic. For the first figure, the browser checks to see if there's an SVG element inside it. There isn't, so the first figure element isn't selected by our rule. For the second figure element, the browser checks and Yes, there is an SVG element here. So the figure element in the second case is matched and thus the second figure is floated to the right. That's pretty cool. But what else can we do with has? Well, let's try styling the fig caption elements based on what other elements are inside their figures. Using a simple CSS descendant selector, the kind of thing available in CSS since 1996, we select both fig captions and make them italic orange. But what if we want the captions and figures containing SVG elements to be not italic and also centered in the figure element? For that, our second rule checks for figures that contain SVG elements. The second figure element is a match, so the fig caption is selected and set to a normal font style while also having the text centered. This illustrates how you can use has anywhere in the selector, not just at the end. Thanks to this, an entire universe of possibilities opens up. Here's a simple example. Suppose you have a table where some rows are used to show the totals of the rows above them. We can see one of those here in the fourth of the seven rows shown. And here is a browser's basic rendering of that table with some body and regular table styles applied, nothing too fancy. With has, we can select any TR element that contains a cell with a class of total. And we can also select elements that are in a relationship to that row, such as its child elements. And with that, we set the totals row visually apart from the other rows without having to add classes to the row itself. This kind of technique can be very useful for design patterns like product cards in an online store. Here's the markup that represents one of the cards. We didn't hide any classes, IDs, or other markup for this example. This is everything in a card's markup not counting the values in the SRC and href attributes, which were elided for brevity. So here's the basic markup tree for a product card. It doesn't need 100 classes or nested elements to render as shown here, although 
it's true that these cards do clearly have a fair amount of CSS applied to them to size the images, text, and so on. That said, there are a few classes in the markup, mostly there to flag the bits of data that need special attention and don't have appropriately semantic HTML elements to represent them. Let's label the cards that have these sale and coupon classes inside them. As the screenshot shows, a sale paragraph is turned into the red ribbon in the corner and the coupon paragraph is made green thanks to some CSS we're applying just off screen. If we want to draw extra attention to the products that are on sale, we can use has to give those divs a light drop shadow and a red two pixel border. We can also add a bit of a green glow to the insides of cards with coupon codes. It's perhaps a bit subtle, but we don't want to upstage the sale styling too much, particularly on cards where there is already sale styling, such as the baseball cap here. For that matter, we can combine two has pseudo classes to style product cards where the items are both on sale and have a coupon code, combining a red border with a green outlining, removing the inner green glow, and strengthening the drop shadow. Then again, with a slightly different selector, we can apply those styles to any product card for an item that is on sale or has a coupon code by putting a grouped selector inside the has, instead of chaining two has pseudo classes together on the selector like we did previously. This is maybe a bit much. So let's go back to the previous three rules that have the results shown here a red border with a drop shadow for sale items, a subtle green inner glow for coupon items, and a sort of a combination of the two with extra drop shadow for items that are both on sale and have a coupon. The previous rules did assume that the price and coupon paragraphs would be children of the card's div container, but what if we decided, for whatever reason, to wrap them in a div of their own? In that case, we just dismiss the child combinators and the rules will continue to work as they did before. There are many, many patterns we can create using has. We could style the canvas of a page that has somewhere in its markup an element with a class of about page. Or we could style any header with a class of page that's part of a body if the body contains a nav element with a class of sub nav. Or we could style any element with a class of hero whenever that element has, somewhere inside it, both a hyperlink and an element with a class of by, which could be the same element, but doesn't have to be. We can also apply styles conditional on the length of an element. Here, if a table's body contains a row that is the seventh child of the T body, then every even numbered row that's a child of that same table body gets a silver background. So we're applying what's known as zebra striping, but only to tables that have more than six table rows. In a mirror image of that, we can apply the usual 1M of margin to the block start and end of unordered lists. But in cases where the list doesn't have a fourth list item child element, in other words, any list that has three or fewer LI elements, in those cases, we can double the usual block margins in order to more obviously set the list apart from the surrounding text. We aren't limited to child combinators either. Here, any H4 that has an immediately following block quote element gets an orange bottom border. But if the immediately following block quote has at least one child paragraph element, the H4's bottom border is made thicker. In this use case, we've selected any A element inside the nav that has a following sibling with a class of current and added a symbol at the end of each one. In other words, we've created a preceding sibling selector as opposed to a following sibling selector. The only A elements selected here are those that have a sibling with a class of current that comes after them in the markup. Here are just a few more patterns to consider. In the first case, any div that contains an H2 or H3 element 
and is itself the immediately following sibling of a div that contains a table with a class of data, gets a big start margin. In the second case, any div element that does not have any IMG elements inside it gets some inline padding. And last, any div that does not have elements other than IMG inside it will get a border. That might be a little hard to follow. So what it's doing is saying that if a div has zero or more IMG elements and no other elements of any kind descending from it, then it gets selected. As we've seen in the last 10 minutes, the number of new CSS patterns that has pseudo class makes possible is essentially infinite and allows for removing any JavaScript that compensates for the lack of something like has in CSS. This enormous leap forward in web design capability is coming soon to mobile and desktop Chromium browsers, thanks to work done by Igalia, the world's leading open source browser consultancy.